Well, hello, I am Greg Kutsona. You heard me warm up there just a little bit early. And I'm really excited to get this conversation going. Um, I co-direct along with Drew Rick Miller, Science for the Church. Uh, we bring the resources of science to Christian congregations for the sake of spiritual growth. We are co-hosting this event with Upper House, and I'm also on the faculty of Comparative Religion and Humanities at Chico State University. I wanted to let you know again that I'm really excited about this event, and particularly the two people that I'm going to be talking with today. Cleve Tinsley IV is Assistant Professor and Executive Director of the Center for African American History and Culture at Virginia Union University. Um, among his many interests, Cleve studies religion and Black freedom movements. He's working on a manuscript, Making Black Lives Matter, Religion and Race in the Struggle for African American Identity. Elaine Howard Eklund is professor of sociology at Rice University. She directs its religion and public life program. And she also co-hosts a new podcast, Religion Unmuted, and has written numerous articles and books, and most recently, Why Science and Faith Need Each Other, Eight Shared Values That Move Us Beyond Fear. So welcome to both Cleve and Elaine. Thanks, Greg, for having us. This is a real privilege. Indeed, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. It's so great. So great to talk about this topic of science, race, and the church, a conversation about repentance and redemption. So uh, I thought we'd just start with a general question. You know, how do race, science, and the church intersect from your uh, vantage point? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, I guess I'll start. I mean, I that's think- That's great. I should probably yeah. say, Cleve, let me start with you. Here we yeah. go, Cleve, let me start with you. <laughs> You're gonna have to direct us, Greg. We're not <laughs> right. exactly. I gotta put on my teacher yeah. hat. <laughs> We're gonna have to get in our academic interrupting way. Okay, Yeah. I'll be quiet. I think. I mean, I think all uh, three, both institutional and kind of uh, as dis modes of discourse kind of structure uh, hierarchy and power and kind of how we understand and come to know the world. And so I think we, as we think about each of these three domains, racial categorization, the church large writ, and also science, there's always been these kind of uh, competing uh, tussle between which authoritative means by which we come to understand and come to know our worlds and which one is most authoritative in the world. So all three of them have had uh, great promising opportunities, but also all three of them have also caused us to have deep tensions and harm. And so I think all of our work intersecting along these, these lines have been uh, uh, fruitful modes of kind of doing inquiry and research in this, in this time. Yes, yeah. Well, and they intersect in really interesting ways, which I know both you and Elaine as social scientists and sociologists and critical theorists and all the different ways that you approach these topics will help us to understand. And of course, they're really poignant this year um, when we think of the emergence, uh, particularly of uh, the prominence of the Black Lives Matter movement. I know it didn't start in 2020, but it was so, it, after the killing of George Floyd, there was so much uh, public awareness uh, of racism in our country, to be quite blunt. Um, so Elaine, how do you see these, uh, inter this intersection of science, race, and the church? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I What's coming to mind actually is um, interviews I did for two studies. So um, I have directed a study on scientists' attitudes towards religion, a couple of studies on that topic. And then um, Cleve and I did partner together on research looking at race, religion, and science um, for one of our studies as well. And I remember interviewing this um, the scientist and I asked him his race and he said, um, I'm, I'm not going to tell you my race because if I tell you my race, now keep in mind, um, there were 1600, 1600 scientists in our study, in this particular study. He says, I'm not going to tell you my race because if I tell you my race, that will be completely identifying. And I said, you know, sir, that's not probably true. Like we report these things in the aggregate, meaning we pool everyone together. And um, so people's race is not, it doesn't identify them as people. And he said, no, actually, if I tell you my race, since I'm one of only three 
um, black physicists in my particular field in the entire US. If I tell you my race, um, you will know who I am. And um, my husband's actually a physicist in the area that this man is in. And I went home and I said, tell me the three black physicists in the US in your area. And he named that man second. And so, I mean, the kind of marginalization of, um, of black people and people of color in general in science is real. It, it's real. Even when you're at the top, you never feel like you belong. And that interview with that man just taught me so much. He was a case of one, but his experiences illuminated, I think, dynamics in science more broadly. And he was also um, a very committed Christian. And, mm -hmm. and he, as we went on in that interview, he felt deeply marginalized, both because of his race and because of his faith. And even though he had risen to the top in his particular field, um, it had come at a cost um, to him personally. And yes. so in, on lots of different levels, both in his church community um, and um, in other kinds of communities that he was a part of and he never felt like he belonged. And so yes. I just think that that to me um, was really interesting and kind of it's one of those interviews that, you know, in 15 years of doing research on these topics, I'm like, wow, that really set me in a different direction. And then the other example I'm thinking of um, is from some of the work that um, Cleve and I have done together. And um, thinking about um, one of the focus, I don't know if you even remember this, Cleve, but one of the focus groups we were leading where we were leading a, a group, um, and Cleve has a really rich background, um, both in a, in a previous life, he was in engineering, and then he was um, worked in pastoral work um, in the Houston area and has an MDiv degree and was one of these people with multiple degrees. And um, so it's, it's kind of fun to see, you know, the connections, Cleve, that you brought to our studies and um, the intellectual depth have been really extraordinary and unparalleled. Um, but we were in this focus group together with Black pastors. And I remember um, talking about science and their attitudes towards science. And one of the pastors said, um, you need to remember that science doesn't feel safe for everyone. And I thought, wow, like what a powerful statement, science is safe for everyone. What does that mean? And I was, I think I was just really naive um, and probably still am in many ways to some of the dynamics. And he talked to us about how even though he had not personally experienced um, the Tuskegee syphilis trials, which of course was when the US federal government allowed men to continue to suffer from syphilis, even at, to, to study them, to use them as um, experiment on them um, and not give them the medical treatment they needed and they knew perfectly well what was happening. And he hadn't experienced that personally, he was too young to have experienced that. But in his church community, um, the idea that science and by extension medicine didn't feel safe for very good reasons, um, right. you know, had been passed through um, his community. Right. And I think that kind of turns things on its head, especially in the science community needs to take note um, that the, that fears that people have um, and of science as risky are not necessarily unfounded. I think sometimes we as scientists like look at certain communities and we're like, oh, if only we could educate them better and they could become smarter, then it would all be OK. Right. Um, there is a very significant culture of memory um, of of harm and discrimination and um and i i cleave i think you said it best one time you know we are not the experimenters we are people who've been exper experimented on mm -hmm. and what does that mean and how is that kind of sentiment in some ways rightly upheld um in certain kinds of church communities and the fear is not unfounded yes um i do want to ask a question of you cleave also, but I, I noticed that there's a, like a ray of heaven coming down on my screen, if you can see that blue line. So I'm going to change my uh, lighting. <laughs> I kind of like it. I like it. it. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a little different. I haven't gotten that before. Um, and I'll go off screen for just a minute. But Cleve, I want to ask you uh, about this work that you and Elaine have been a part of in the past. Uh, I think you worked together for seven years. Uh, yeah. So tell us about that. So I, I've had the privilege of working with Elaine since about 2013, my second year. In graduate study and I, the first project I was I was on and uh, was religious understandings of science where we went into several African-American churches in Houston and Chicago and several areas really asking questions about how factors of 
socioeconomic status and class and all these parameters affect views of science. And really I saw my project was really gauging mistrust of science in these mm -hmm. institutions, right? As Elaine has kind of mentioned, uh, history, Tuskegee experiment, Henrietta Lacks, even current crises around uh, vaccinations and how they will apply to folks who suffer with comorbidities due to inequity in health conditions, right? There's reasons that folks are reluctant about even whether I'm gonna get the vaccination now. So, so science had always had these impinging effects of, on black communities in particular and why there is this mistrust. And so uh, I, during my second year, I still was working out methodology, right? Ways in which I wanted to get at some of the research questions I had and what I appreciate about that initial project was I was able to find myself, right? To bridge these worlds, being a local pastor for so many years, uh, having a scientific temper and also being able to combine that social scientific research with the people aspect. I really cared about not only their perspective, but I found that that kind of uh, social scientific or anthropological kind of engagement or immersion was really fascinating and struck me in a way, but I also was interested in kind of figuring out creative uh, and empathic ways of asking research questions in a way that didn't threaten our informants, if that makes sense, right? Wow. I think there's a way that we as researchers can come in and while we, we try to you know put on glosses of being objective all the way, uh, no one is totally disconnected from their personal lives, right? I think Elaine and I can talk about that, how her husband's a science, so she's researching science. I've always had these large questions about who the heck am I, which is why I research identity, right? <laughs> and so I think um, that project was really pivotal and formative for me, not only as a scholar, but also showed me the benefit of how science, even as a social scientist, how my own research can kind of contribute to knowledge production, but also I think better care toward these communities. And I think um, that was the first project. We then went on to work on several projects, religion, inequality and in science education. Uh, and then we end up doing uh, several works together. And so uh, in that respect, Dr. Eklund and uh, Elaine rather, <laughs> uh, <laughs> has a great, a, a great mentor in, the, in those initial stages of that and really just kind of informed my own research when I got, got to do my own dissertation work in my current work now. And so it was, really informative and helpful, but I found that science in particular as a topic, uh, teasing out how we could do that, right? Because there's always these questions about how do we investigate in vulnerable communities, but figuring out how, out how to do that in a way that not only made sense, that did not cause harm, but in, in a way really added to the research, right? right? Because there first was a categorization problem, black evangelicals or black Protestant often lumped into folks, right? But yeah. then there's also, there's a challenge of how to effectively engage with these communities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the advantage I think I had at the time being a graduate student and not having been fully professionalized yet was I still was close enough to be able to uh, form some uh, really sincere connections by really being viewed as one of them. And so I really appreciate that opportunity. And while doing those, so I think we really gleaned some great research that there's not this great opposition to science, there's room for collaboration, but there is this latent distrust due to cultural memory, if not explicit memory itself. Yes, yes. And that's so important to take in. Um, Elaine and I were on this panel uh, yesterday uh, with the International Society on Science, uh, and Science and Religion, and they were looking at these two different pieces we had written, um, her new book um, on why science and faith need each other. I'm tempted to put it up on the screen. I'll do it. Here we go. There it is. <laughs> and then a book that I wrote, um, where I researched the history of science and religion in the United States uh, from about uh, the 17th, 18th century to the present. And the reason I mentioned that is that as I did that research, um, I found the presence of scientific racism, <clears throat> excuse me, and eugenics particularly, just uh, like I could not get away from it. It almost, uh, as I know you both are authors, it almost took over the whole book, to be honest. Like it was almost like, this is gonna be a book about eugenics and scientific racism because racism is such a part of uh, America. And uh, I've just added to that, that my daughter uh, is a doctoral student in anthropology at Berkeley and she studies Native American cultures. And she's really sensitized me to also that uh, terrible history of, of the United States of, um, you know, the, the dislocation of uh, American Indians in, in our country. And the reason I mention that is just to say, this is such a part of how we come to this topic that seems like 
the most neutral objective topic, science. But yeah. really it isn't because people come to science. Science is done in culture. Science is done in social settings. And I hope you're hearing a segue to you both um, as social scientists. Uh, what does sociology and social scientific research help us? How does it help us understand uh, the topics of race science in the church? I'm gonna go to Elaine first in this, in this case. Thanks, Greg. Um, so sociology, my field of social science is the study of group behavior. And science um, is not just a set of ideas. Um, it's, it's funny, like I teach this class sometimes on sociology of science at Rice University where I teach. And I ask students on the first day what they think science is. And um, people start giving me the scientific method and talk about hypothesis testing. And science is all of that, but science is also um, communities of people. So people do science and people interpret um, scientific results. Um, and whenever you get people involved, um, there are power inequalities. There are some people who have power um, and other people who have less power. Um, and all of that has an impact on um, what kind of science is done and, and who gets to benefit from science um, and who interprets science. So you bring all of that in. And then I could say um, religion also is um, not just sets of, sets of belief systems but, and ideas, but it is very deeply um, groups of people. And then you get these, these groups of people um, interacting um, with one another. So both science and religion are lived and um, they are lived often in relationship to one another. And often their identity as groups is, um, is really made complete by saying who's inside that group and who's outside that group by doing right. boundary work between their group and other groups. And so all of that comes, um, and then you bring in um, race and racism as well. And um, we know that in the US at least, um, uh, black and brown peoples, um, and in particular, Black Americans and Hispanic Americans are overrepresented um, in certain group, in certain religious groups. Um, in particular, for Black Americans in Christian groups, and for Hispanic Americans um, in Christian groups as well. Although there certainly is a variety of Black religion. Um, I can hear I can hear Cleve's voice when he's not even because <laughs> Cleve is Cleve is an expert in black religion and so I, I would say there are varieties of black religion I don't want to be monolithic here um, right. but I so I think it's important to think about those dynamics and when you're overrepresented your people group is overrepresented in a group that is often also feels marginalized in science so um, there are not very many there are not nearly as many Christians in science as there are in the general population. Um, one can start to feel um, very doubly um, marginalized. And so that's, there's a lot of, I could talk on and on, there's a lot of different kinds of dynamics there, but those are some of that are coming to mind right now. Well, and I, I think, uh, you know, this newsletter that we just uh, did a, the interview, we presented an interview that I had with you about this, uh, our Science for the Church newsletter, which came out yesterday, had uh, you, some of your comments on that. And it also has a link to the longer podcast that you and I did about social science and religion uh, for my teaching in uh, science and religion. Uh, I do, I, I wanted to bring in, um, uh, in addition to this, I, I, I have a strong, maybe this is a confession, uh, that I have a strong bent to be convinced by Friedrich Nietzsche mm -hmm. that much of human relations is uh, about power. And I think within the Christian framework, we uh, have a new understanding of power. We have an understanding of power as empowerment. But when we talk about groups, um, there's a lot about who has power. And the power in science is so significant that uh, whoever grabs and holds that power has cultural and social power. And mm -hmm. I think that's why race comes in because um, as uh, we've put into the newsletter from Science for the Church, and as many people know, uh, race as a biological category is not really sustainable. So it is really a cultural category, which is very, very powerful. And when cultural categories are used, they're often used to hold power uh, and to use power against other people. Um, Cleve, I, I wanna ask you the next question. So you can either take that up or take up the question of the particulars of COVID-19 and 
the access to medical uh, mm. you know, care um, and how that um, COVID-19 has, has struck uh, communities of color more strongly uh, and, and more disastrously in many cases than other communities. So you can either, please feel free. I'm, you, I, as I said to you before our conversation, I just wanna create space for you to talk because you're both so interesting. So take up whatever you'd like and let us hear some of your insights about it. Yeah, so I, I like to back up a bit, meaning I've, so here's where I distinguish and Dr. Eklund Lane knows this as well. So I use social scientific methods or ethnography to kind of get at some research questions, but really my training more so is as a critical theorist of religion, right? Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that, I ask certain questions about what religion is and what it does mm -hmm. and how it formed. And so uh, I use social theory to get at these, these kind of questions, but backing up more to a, a question you asked about, about the relationship between science and race specifically, as you know, uh, Greg, you're studying uh, 18th century, the rise of the enlightenment and the different power dynamics going on during that during that time, I just think about how these two categories are competing in, in certain ways for like the hierarchy of people. So you can't separate that from colonialization, from of course, uh, persons of Euro descent rising and those kind of justified different people positions in countries, right? And I always say, you know, uh, all of us are positioned by discourses, right? And so at this time, right, religious authorities becoming to be displaced a bit at discourses being authoritative and others. And so for me, uh, my, all my study really relates to how African-Americans who have been historically objects have come to be subjects in this quest for understanding who they are, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, religion then, right, is just this more common tussle with these discourses for meaning making in space and time. Yes, we all have Christian frameworks for understanding that, those of us who are on this call, but what I try to argue in all my work is that, hey, really this tussle goes on in several authoritative frameworks. I say that to say this as it relates to COVID, as it relates to science in general, we have to understand that um, as people take subject positions or as we begin to quest who we are in this world, all folks, folks of color, historically oppressed groups are struggling through these different means and these different power differentials. So we have to be especially conscious as Christians to understand that there's always room for us to have uh, skepticism around the categories that we presume all the time. What do we mean by these different terms? And so I wanted to back up and say, that's what I try to disentangle in my work is to kind of get at some of the power di differentials behind some of the terms that we take for granted sometimes, right? Yeah. When we yeah. say Christian or evangelical Christian, or for instance, uh, just I think yesterday, a statement on Baptist faith and message came out from Southern Baptist mentors about critical theory and academics and what they don't. All that is about what? establishing certain domains of power and who has the right to kind of define what it means to be what a Christian in this kind of sense. And so I say, I like to say that these things for us as Christians is we have to be careful to kind of think more deeply about these things when we do our research, because uh, we got to read the way that we kind of weaponize sometimes our terms and our tools and our methods of understanding uh, oftentimes has bearing on how these different groups negotiate different things. And so, kind of want, so I kind of wanted to mention that there. And as it relates to science, I think in this time we find ourselves now, we see how science is both is used by a wide array of political and ideological spectrums. On the one hand, science uh, is about making people feel better and get these vaccinations. On the other hand, science is not to be trusted because it's uh, kind of all kind of conspiracy theories about what's going on. They're trying to tra track people. And so I think religion here has a, a great place on this in this, in this point right now, because we're thinking about how do we congregate together? Scientific people have to come together and kind of help congregations think through that. How do we move forward? What's safe for us to do? So I think uh, all of our research is definitely necessary because as you know, you can't do any field of research where race and science don't collide in whatever your interests are, no matter what your discipline is, right? Mm -hmm. These kind of scientific methods that we use collide with even the kind of power differentials within which we do our own research in. And so I just think, um, science and race and religion will always be significant and also be these, these kind of things that we have to contend with as we do our research. Well, I just realized I really want to buy your book, by the way. I love what you were saying there that, uh, I mean, there's so much that you're unpacking and especially I've, I keyed in on this phrase, uh, moving from objects to subjects, right? That's mm. a key part of how power is used within society and culture. And I also um, drew out my, my next uh, uh, voice that mentor for me, and not somebody I knew personally, um, but following Nietzsche is 
Michel Foucault, who talked about the, the discourse, right? How does discourse frame power and what you, what you can say, who can say it? And uh, I, I don't know, I, I resonated with a lot of what you were talking about. Um, I would add uh, to both Cleve and Elaine that, you know, I think, and I appreciate you bringing this in, Cleve, that as Christians, we have this vision. For me, it comes from the book of Revelation. We have all the tribes and tongues and peoples coming and bringing their tribute to, um, you know, to, the, to God. And I think when we have not, um, uh, when that is not happening, we are not, we are not getting the fullness of God's vision for this world. And that's why race is important. Um, because race is a way in which we are not letting the fullness of, uh, of God's vision be realized. You know, of course, uh, in, my, in my theology, that's to come in fullness, but I think we can experience some of that um, right now. And uh, you talked about you this word negotiating, which um, actually is in the title of this book that I just wrote. And I, the reason I used it was negotiations um, are often over uh, who has power, who uses the goods of society. And I believe that science and religion and adding race, uh, is, race is not in the title of my book, but um, the, this idea that as we negotiate these forces, we're trying to see what is the common good for the United States, um, for, for America. And I use the word America, realizing that America, there's, uh, you know, other countries that use the term America, but America actually is a concept for us. It's actually not only American dream, I also talk about sometimes the dream of America. Like there's a thing we think of as America and uh, that may or may not really exist. And how do we in, in make sure that that includes the fullness of the vision that we have that all persons are created equal, right? Um, that we have an ability for there to be people in this country that um, are able to take the goods we have and seek the common good together. So um, I don't know, I, I'll just say that your comments are very stimulating to my own thinking. And, and I, wanna I wanna move, uh, if we can, into the, before we take some questions in about 10 minutes or so and do the question and answer, into these topics of uh, further of COVID-19, which again is, just to be clear, has affected uh, communities of color disproportionately. And uh, it might be worthwhile to, to just say why that's true, um, because not everybody may have all the, you know, the, the insights into that. And then also the recent presidential election. <laughs> I mean, 2020 has been such a year. We've got COVID, we've got, uh, you know, the racial, uh, so social unrest and the rising up of uh, concerns, uh, like in, as in Black Lives Matter. And then we had this presidential election, which was so contentious um, of course, uh, it's still being resisted by certain um, components of the Republican Party as to the, the outcome of it. But we have the president-elect Biden, vice president-elect Kamala Harris. They also are part of this conversation of race and science um, and even uh, religion in our country. So again, softball wide pitch, uh, sorry, softball pitch. Um, I will look, I'm gonna go back to Cleve first. Is it, how would you, what are something you want to, uh, take yeah. up in that uh, in those topics, and how do you view some of these cu cultural events that are happening right now? These very specific events in relation to the topic of race, science, and religion. Yeah, I think here I'll, I'll set Elaine up here, but I think this moment perfectly, I guess, connects to what we're talking about here about race, science, and religion. If you think about what's been happening since June and July regarding the Black Lives Murder, I'm um, the Black Lives Matter movement, it's, and it's kind of renaissance during this time. It's been affected since 2011, but really, again, the summer came to light. When you think about COVID-19 and sciences, the kind of battle over science's authority right now versus ideology, if you think about religion, there's no stronger block right now in America than white evangelicalism, right? And kind of how that's being played in several sectors for different power struggles. So when we talk about these three categories, they're right in front of us right now, right? Science is a big factor. Who to listen to, who's the authority? Do we listen to the scientists in public health right now? Do we listen to our political leadership or our religious leadership, right? Uh, how does that really factor out in racial inequality? Uh, black mortality is up, black unemployment is up. And so all these factors are kind of really setting up right now. So I think uh, careful analysis, religious analysis, both how science plays a role into that and how kind of racial inequality and inequity is really important for right now and for our research, right? And I think, you know, uh, for what I, 
for what I go back and revisit right now, I have to think about that more. The ways that I think about, for instance, a big part of my work now around this fact thinks about social death right now. What does it mean to be black in America? A lot of folks think about a kind of social death. Just mean, what does that mean? It means a kind of structure, kind of deep historical inequality that, that blacks have to persistently fight through just to try to get ahead and to kind of participate in this democratic experiment, right? How that becomes factor along lines of health, medical care, all these things are things that I have to analyze before I move through to some other factors. Still that in Dr. Eklund's now, as research kind of looked at, regardless of all these impediments, blacks by and large, 90% of black folk claim some kind of faith tradition, right? Mm -hmm. Most of them are part of evangelical black, black evangelical tradition, right? Why does that kind of happen, right? So I think uh, this moment right now is very important for research on, on, on science, of course, but also on race and religion, those intersections right now. Mm -hmm. Because although a lot of folks will claim to have a common faith, right, or common quest for the common good, there's still deep divisions amongst folks who are part of, supposed to be part of the same family, right? The same reign of God still has so many divisions within it, right? We will agree on a lot of things, but when it comes to certain matters, there's so much disagreement. And I think the struggle for us, both as thinkers, but also as practitioners, right, is to think about how can we use research in a way to kind of like help understand why these divides exist in the first place, but also kind of point out the kind of common grounds there. And I yeah. think that's where I think all of our work specifically can, can speak to something beyond just our vocations, if that makes sense. Yes. Well, and if I don't mind, if you don't mind, if we do a follow up there, uh, one of the things we want to do in uh, this particular event and in the following events that will happen uh, on race and science and religion at Upper House in, co uh, in collaboration with Science for the Church. And by the way, stay tuned for those and you can sign up to know more about those. Um, is we want to get practical because a lot of the people that are the Science for the Church crowd are practitioners in the church. And um, so Cleve, do you have any suggestions that can be, that can help take the kind of research that you and Elaine have done, uh, I guess to some degree I've done, and help the church be a place, uh, to use Kendi's words, that are anti-racist, right? Mm -hmm. That actually move against racism in our country. It kind of relates, I just happened to see one of the questions one of your respondents submitted about uh, how do white evangelicals participate without coming off of being white saviors, so to speak. It relates to your Yeah, question. good. Take yeah. it up. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also I think it relates to work that uh, Elaine and I tried to do even as researchers, right? There are ways that we often thought about, is, are there ways that, yes, we, we have research to do in these churches, but are there ways that we can also do some collaborative things together? Can scientists go, and I know Elaine does this in churches in Houston already with her, her church already, have seminars or things where folks go into these churches and present scientific data and information so that there's true collaboration that exists because black churches, uh, Latino churches, they have medical doctors, they have folks who are, who are versed in this stuff. But what tends to happen is there's this big divide oftentimes between the academy and the church on the one hand, mm -hmm. um, and also information gathering. So of course we're in times of COVID, but now I think, especially during this time, I think there's more possibility for there to be more collaborative kind of conversations and kind of unique kind of collaborative things to happen where we share data across lines with each other. And I think to answer one of the questions there about how does how do white evangelicals participate with black communities or black churches is this kind of key terms that's out there in communities about learning how to be like in solidarity with communities instead of trying to uh, quote unquote save communities, right? That means just coming alongside, trying to meet the real need first, right? Meeting the kind of spiritual needs will automatically arise. But I just think if we're more thoughtful in going into any communities of difference, uh, if we're just there to kind of really present research one, or just kind of meet the need, the kind of human aspect will come out. Those laden spiritual burdens and needs will automatically arise. And if you establish a kind of trust and work in relationship with them, those things will automatically happen. So yeah. I think for those who are all sincere folks across racial lines, if you really wanna create collaborative, meaningful relationships across these lines, it just means really being willing to kind of go in those spaces and learning from your mistakes. Right. Knowing that, you know, being okay with being uncomfortable sometimes because right. you're going to make mistakes. I've made plenty of mistakes <laughs> going into many communities, whether they were uh, communities uh, of folks of uh, Black feminist communities or other communities or, or Latino community or, or, or my Asian American friends. I made plenty of mistakes, but I just think it involves us continuing to go back, owning up when we mess up and saying, here, 
and just being sincere about our efforts. And so I think those are places we can start at. I love that. I, and I, I love what you said. And I, I'm thinking of a phrase that came out of, I probably shouldn't point my pencil though. I'll put that down. I'm thinking of a phrase that Elaine, one of your guests had on your podcast of passing the mic, right? Mm. I'm making sure that you're not holding the mic and giving it to like, again, if you're a person with power, giving it, some, you know, like this way, but like just pass it, let that person have the stage, um, sit down, listen, learn. You know what I mean? I think, I think a posture of learning can be really helpful. And I do want to add one thing um, into this. One of the other parts of doing research on the history of the church uh, as a person who's been part of, um, you know, white Protestantism, uh, white evangelically oriented Protestantism is realizing that there is this deep root of racism in um, the, the white Protestant church. I mean, again, I, I think I'm just restating what I've already said, but I, I want to tie it into one of the topics in the um, in the title of this conversation today, which is repentance. Um, I think repentance is one of the strongest points of the Christian faith. Um, what I see in the cultural discourse often is everything but repentance. It's about why it wasn't my fault or why everything I did that was wrong was understandable. But repentance says, no, actually there's something I've done that uh, either I, that oftentimes I intended to do and I'm turning away from it and I'm gonna be public if there's a public element to the repentance that I need to have. And as a person in uh, predominantly white churches, I want to I want to be part of a practical movement to say, here's the way in which this part of the Christian body needs to turn around. You know, repentance meaning to turn to a different direction, turn toward the kingdom is my, I, I would argue, turn toward God, what God wants, this, this uh, justice, this care for people who have often been marginalized. So I think repentance um, in the in the white church is a, an important part of uh, of our response. And as I said, it's, when you got a history as long as the church in America has of the sin of racism, repentance is going to be a critical element. Um, Lane, you've uh, I haven't uh, turned to you for a minute. Um, do you want to say something about particulars of COVID nineteen or about the presidential election and how that uh, the intersections of race, science, and religion play into those. Yeah, the there's a lot. <laughs> um, the last um, I'm a conversation I had um, with a, another black friend who is an academic, um, kind of are coming to mind, and we were both um, part of an event a month ago that was really hard hitting. We had um, it was on racism and religion and the speakers really were were hard hitting about the realities of racism in America. And I, um, after I was part of that event, which I co-sponsored through Rice University, I, um, you know, I said to this friend like, oh, was that like too hard hitting? You know, will people come away from that um, feeling like too discouraged? And, and she said to me, you know, sometimes people just need to sit with the truth for a while. And I thought that was a great, um, that, that was another one of those reframing conversations for me. I think I've been very quick, um, you know, as a leader to get to um, practical kinds of takeaways um, related to race um, and faith and science. And I think those are, those are good things that we ought to shoot for them. But um, repentance um, can't come too lightly, if that makes sense. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, you know, um, if you have a child who was raised in an abusive family, um, uh, you know, if you have your public face where you pretend everything is okay, and it's, it's not really okay, that's not redemption, that's just living a lie. And so that it's just sort of, I've been thinking about things a little differently lately that um, we maybe need to dwell more in um, the reality of race. So why are all of our faith and science organizations mainly populated by white people? Why are, you know, how do white people mainly lead them? Why do, you know, sort of thinking about some of these things that hit very close to home for some of us in this space, um, I think is really important. And social science, I do think can be useful not to tout my own um, discipline too much. Well, but, go ahead, do it. Um, but go, go but if, I, if I'm really <laughs> pressed to, um, 
you know, sociology can't really tell you how to live. I mean, that's not really what sociology is supposed to be doing. But I do think it can um, describe realities. I mean, when you start hearing um, some, you know, the kind of statistics we're getting about the virus now, where um, deaths um, disproportionately, I mean, I'm not talking just a little bit disproportionately, massively disproportionate uh, amount of death in black and brown communities, because of course, um, these folks are more likely to be on the front lines of work, um, less likely to have excellent medical care. Um, and so there is this kind of just very difficult reality that we're in as a country right now. And I'm afraid we'll um, try to gloss over it too quickly without really leaning into the reality of the injustice. And so I do think sociology can help us describe reality. And then we need theology, we need, um, we need other kinds of bodies of knowledge to um, help us understand what to do with that. And I, I do think there's hope, but we can't um, make hope a light thing um, or a thin thing. Um, it needs to be based in a deep um, sense of reality and the, the need for repentance and um, sitting with the hard truth. Yes, yes. It's, it, it's like uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's cheap grace, you know. Mm -hmm. you yeah, don't well like, put, well put. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's really hard. I mean, that's really, really, I, I just want to, I, I don't want to sit with the difficulty of that, the necessity of the difficulty, but the difficulty, you know. Um, uh, there's a phrase that I've uh, has been used of friendship uh, and of uh, relationships within, I don't know, organizations. You can pay now or you can pay later. And mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to have that hard conversation in the early part. Otherwise, by putting it off so long, something bad's going to happen. And um, I think we're seeing and have seen uh, what happens with the problem of racism in our country. Certainly, um, if we had another slot, we could talk about uh, you know misogyny and the way in which women also are underrepresented. And I remember Francis Collins saying he doesn't want to be part of you know the head of the NIH. No more mantles, right? No more panels with only men on it. He wants to make sure that there are uh, uh, women represented. I think the same thing uh, needs to be true for those of us who are able to put together panels, right, and conversations. Um, I want to see if we <laughs> if we can tackle this topic. From Len Tang, who uh, is um, been part of uh, Science for the Church's work in the when one of our projects in the past, um, he he asked this question. Let's see if either of you have an answer for it. A week ago, Harper Bazaar had an article called "The Racial Reckoning Inside Planned Parenthood" about Planned Parenthood's founder Margaret Sanger and her connection with eugenics. Can you comment on this connection? Do either of you want to take that that topic? Oh, Cleve's uh, muted. No, I was just saying, uh, Elena, I yield to you first on that one. <laughs> um, here's what's coming to mind. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, that's how I always start out, and then I see if something does. Yeah, so, right, exactly. <laughs> a friend of mine said, first of all, and that was just always a delay. He became a great lawyer after that. He's like, always first of all. <laughs> He gave like five seconds to get his head together. <laughs> uh, I can't believe I'm I'm laughing. That's a I'm laughing because I'm uncomfortable. That's a that's a hard question. Um, yeah. I think it uh, some you know I am not sure how those on this call view uh, Margaret Sanger. Some view her as um, a great reformer and a progressive, and I think it um, shows that that Harper's article, which I'm familiar with. Um, shows how complicated power is and how complicated identity is to some extent. Um, as more and more is uncovered, um, we realized how much, I mean, we should go ahead and, and call it what it is, how much sin and evil um, it was behind some of her ideas um, about the power inequality between groups. And yet she was also viewed as a progressive and I think um, in the same way, um, I, I need to be careful here, I think, but um, in the same way, I think, you know, white progressives um, in the US right now are experiencing a kind of reckoning. Um, and, you know, what does it really mean for us to, to be progressive? 
Um, what does that look like? What do alignments among groups look like? Um, so there's there's a lot there. There's a lot right. there. And these That's issues a, are also very wrapped up into science, right? Um, and, and the use of science, right? And the use of science. And there's some excellent um, and, you know, a lot of amazing technologies right now um, on the rise related to the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, right, genetic totally. editing. And I think we need deeper, deeper moral reflection and moral reflection on those technologies that comes out of the science community, but also um, scholars who study race and racism, ethicists, theologians, um, because you know those those technologies have incredible potential to be misused. I mean, scientific the pace of scientific technology often proceeds much more quickly than does the deep moral reflection about that technology. Yes, well, I, I was just I, first of all, you did a, your your delay worked really well because that was really a helpful answer. <laughs> um, I there are a couple things that came out also from. The historical study, you know, um, one of the shocks about eugenics was how eugenics was actually pushed, you know, between 1880 and about 1930 or 30, late 30s was when eugenics was really prominent in our country. And it was pushed by the progressives, not by the conservatives. So Walter Rauschenbusch, the founder of the social gospel, well, I shouldn't say the founder of the social gospel, the articulator of the social gospel, which was picked up from um, from the, from the black church and other other resources as well he was a eugenicist um and that i think is fascinating and uh it was john evans one of your call maybe both of your colleagues from the uc san diego uh, the sociologist who pointed out that actually in the famous 1925 scopes trial the resistance of many conservative christians was against eugenics and social darwinism and um so oddly enough eugenics uh, was positioned with progressive ideology. And we can tell, I, I would say how deeply, I would just say this is how deep racism is, right? Um, it actually sometimes overtakes people who think they're doing good and they do it with sometimes a racist or, or racially uh, tinged, uh, um, the way they do it has racism in it, even if they're not, not trying, I think, uh, or at least they're not reflective on it. Now that's where I think we get into this topic of systemic racism, right? What we're a part of, even if we don't uh, consciously engage with it. Do you mind if I turn uh, to another question or Cleve, did you want to say anything else about that? No, I think you have some striking questions that uh, I'll be interesting for us to get to. Yeah, do you want to try one? I, I mean, is there one that st uh, stands out to you? Yeah, I mean, there's one, I think uh, one of your anonymous center asked a question about, um, oh, they dangerously went to my Twitter stream. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I need to warn you. CV Tinsley, is yeah. that what it is? Yeah. yeah. Go to my I'm going to go there now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, but a person raised a question about uh, an article I, I retweeted from Jamar Tisby, who's a doctoral candidate right now, I think at, um, I forget what school he is. I think he's at the University of Oxford in history. I'm mean, not University of Mississippi in history right now. And he wrote a blog about Southern Baptist Seminary presidents and they reaffirmed their commitment to whiteness. And the question really, the, the, the interlocutor asked about, did Tisby go too far by suggesting whiteness by doing it? I think the kind of move that many would view as being hyperbolic is saying, you know, they just really reaffirm whiteness when really these presidents didn't really, you know, explicitly say that we want to uphold whiteness. I think what Tisby was, I don't know Tisby personally, but what I would suggest he's arguing is that by maintaining this uh, black uh, message and faith frame, in essence, what it does do is kind of uphold a kind of framework of whiteness in which folks have always had to fit into. So yeah, uh, I think your question raises what many would say that seems to be going too far, but it's doing no different than what essentially these presidents are doing in this statement by talking about critical theory and critical race theory as being something that they should not do so. And the same way as they labeling these kind of discourses as being too far to the left, they would say, uh, many would argue Tisby is doing this. And so his use of saying, upholding whiteness why he's saying the statement they didn't do that per se what what they uh, what he is saying is by trying to make sure that they kind of lied or kind of put these discourses at bay what they is doing essentially is maintaining a kind of white hierarchical theological thinking system that of course makes any kind of discourse that wants to center black and oppressed and other kind of bodies at the center uh, 
is being the problem. So I kind of just kind of want to say that. But where you fall on that is going to be how you think about these categories. And I think that's the importance of, but that in itself raises why it's important, I think, for us to engage or at least be more informed about what critical theory is, right? Um, and how it emerged, because then you can understand or at least begin to interrogate and think for yourselves on these kind of different discourses. But by them saying, no, we don't want to engage at all in our schools and make sure none of this stuff even approaches, then what you're essentially saying is that we want to make sure that we shape young minds to think a certain way, right? And that's the whole rise of enlightenment itself, as, as Kant says, right? Learning to think for oneself and being free from these authorities. So that's the kind of how the whole debate itself. And so mm -hmm. I just kind of wanted to point that out. It was a great question. I'm, I'm glad that was raised. Thank you. That's, and that's really helpful. And um, Cleve, you don't mind just taking up one other topic in there, which is this um, concept of whiteness. Um, I know that I don't, I didn't quite get it. I mean, just to be honest, maybe until a year or two ago, you know, and I've been involved, whatever, I'm in academic discourse. I'm in a lot of conversations where, uh, you know, concerns about um, social location and identity are really important. But whiteness is a particular concept. It isn't just identify mm. the skin tone, but it actually is a concept. Would you say a little bit more about that? Well, I'm not, I don't do whiteness studies as much as I do blackness studies, but I will say that mm -hmm. what it, what I do in critical blackness studies really emerges out of the concept of this. Whiteness studies really is essentially that the whole academe, the whole modern movement really has been set up on a kind of Euro descendant kind of movement, right? And so any thought system or knowledge structure in of itself by nature has been shaped by a kind of whiteness. And so when folks say whiteness, they're not talking about white people in particular, they're just talking about the dominant frame and perspective upon which all of these knowledge discourses emerge. That includes our theologies, although we don't want to admit that sometimes. Right, totally, yeah. Whether you like Calvin, whether you like Tillich, all these folks, they still are dominant frames through which uh, historically oppressed groups have to work through to get at sense of human differences and how they kind of are talked about. And right. so what I would argue Tisby is talking about in his blog is saying, the Southern Baptists are really just upholding whiteness. They're saying that, look, the, the predominant students that they're coming through, the folks they want to train are trying to uphold a certain tradition of the Southern Baptists, the reason why they formed in the beginning, mm, separated over slavery, right? Slavery, right. They wanted, There's right. certain issues that they don't want to attack. And so right. the whole nature of this whole discourse about whiteness was a kind of movement in academics that said, listen, we just need to call out and say what this is. We need to figure out the ways that really race functions and how we produce knowledge, right? right. That's right. all really whiteness and blackness studies is, is saying, we're gonna do more analytical work on how, uh, how we're socially located informs how we produce knowledge. Yeah. And so that's really all that really is, is, is at work there. Well, uh, that's, it's so helpful the way you're describing this. And I did want to just add that if we take that perspective of the church, the Christian church worldwide, it's moving away from the, if there was ever a Euro-American centered Christian church, you know, it, it's got to move away because where the growth is happening is uh, away from that center, right? So mm -hmm. to listen to the leading voices are going to be many people of color in South America, um, in Africa and African countries. And uh, it's just kind of a reality. Let's not try to center this discourse. I mean, besides all the, 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 the important ethical components, it's just like, wow, this is the church today. The church is growing in places that aren't defined by whiteness uh, right. and by being white. Um, if I could move, I, I, that was an attempt to move toward the redemptive side, by the way. And I, we've got about <laughs> five more minutes. Um, <laughs> and I think I want to see if we can um, see where there is the redemption. I know we've all touched on it. I believe uh, that we all have as Christians this hope that we can go beyond uh, some of the problems that we're identifying. And um, one of these comes from Don Burnett, who asked, what are the hopeful voices for bringing the gulf between religion, science, and structural racism in explicit in their approach? And the other one is, is there a particular role to play for Christians who are scientists in their places of work, labs, to advance anti-racism? And I would add, in the church. So, um, Elaine, I'll start with you. Uh, do you have a an answer that moves us toward the redemptive side? Um. I, I'd like to answer the, you know, a couple of, of voices and people whose work I, I want to highlight. So um, I think uh, Sylvester James Gates Jr., who's the incoming president of the American Physical Society and um, is a very well-known string theorist, I think has been very creative in how he's thought about faith and science and its relationship to race. Um, and wrote a wonderful letter. I've, I have a bit of insight here because my husband's a, um, 
a fellow of the American Physical Society, but but it's um, so that's how I got my hands on this great letter that Gates wrote. But he's been a real trailblazer in encouraging underrepresented minorities into science, but also um, thinking about um, a creative spiritual response as well, which I think mm -hmm. he's a trailblazer in that area as well. And I'm thinking also about um, Georgia Dunstan, who mm -hmm. is um, at Howard and um, the HBCU, the Historically Black Colleges and Universities in the US have done a lot to encourage um, Black Americans and scientific pursuits. And if you look at the number of students that Dunstan has trained over her lifetime, um, undergraduates, and she's doing a creative project um, with the Divinity School at Howard right now as well. So I just wanna highlight both of them. There are others as well, but I think of the two of them that come to mind when you think about people. Um, so then can I give you 30 more seconds just so we have yeah, a time clear? Yeah. So um, I, I do think that um, we as um, white people can have hope. I don't think we get to say that there's no hope um, for redemption, that um, part of our hope is in um, recapturing a deep sense of humility that um, is, is in the truest form of the Christian tradition that I am not God. And I think of that as being so, so important in these conversations about race and racism. Um, we can be um, brave and um, sit with the truth and realize that there is hope for redemption because we are not God. And I, I think mm -hmm. that's really, really important um, theological insight to bring into this conversation right now. Absolutely. One of those key values, right? Uh, Cleve, what would you close with? I don't know. I think, you know, I, the more I think about at least the, the race, science, or theology interchange, I think one of the most important thinkers, I think, who's really doing some things now, Willie Jennings at Yale now. He's doing some mm -hmm. great things. Mm -hmm. He always thought about race, he and J. Cameron Carter. But I just think right now, especially for our audience today, um, he's really doing some important things that I think we should, that bridges, I think, some of the theoretical things that we, we have in mind here. So he would be the one person. Now, Elaine is more involved in a, a hard scientific discourse than I am. But I, I've just learned, even since I've just been at Virginia Union, another historically black college, I'm fascinated by how STEM research is really cutting edge at HBCUs. I mean, my mother and father went to Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi, and I'm honored to be at VU and to see the rich, robust kind of scientific uh, scientists there doing amazing work is amazing. Now, in many ways, I, I, I come there as a humanist and social scientist trying to push other things but to really uh, engage this really rich and robust scientific community, folks who are doing things in science is, is kind of amazing to me that they, they're able to kind of find these rich resources and do that kind of stuff. But as far as a person, I would just only lift uh, Willie Jennings' name. But I, and I think as it relates to hope, I, I think I've always described myself as a kind of hopeful cynic. I think that comes from the, <laughs> uh, me being deeply, deeply entrenched in activist communities though. And I just have, there's one activist who's popular in the black community called Adrian Marie Brown, who has this thing she calls uh, fractal rea fractal, fractal realities. And it's the same model, I think, of the paradigm of Jesus is if we can just carve out little pockets of possibility, right? Mm -hmm. uh, hope for me comes in small pockets of uh, my relationship with Dr. Eklund before the stuff. I always say to Dr. Eklund a while back, well, Lane, I'm sorry, it's hard for me guys to call her. <laughs> <laughs> But I always say back in 2013 or 17, there was a spark she saw before I saw it in myself. And the bit, and I, and I say that the, only, the major thing she did for me beyond anything else was to inspire confidence, right? Give me enough room to have confidence and to weed through that. And we can't ignore how race is not a factor in that, right? And how that kind of works in academia and other kind of ways. And so I think that's where we can see the reign of God, right? Us being able to create and carve out space for folk to gain different kind of confidences to appreciate difference or have to fight through these different dynamics of power because once we do that if we can just create enough room for folks to really find out who they are um i think we really do change the world then because most of this power dynamic stuff where it just just really squelches people's potential to realize who they are but mm -hmm. if we're able to kind of create more room for that not trying to just maintain power all the time. I think that's what, what really the reign of kind of like 
all this stuff comes into play. And so uh, I think we all oh, have the talent to do that. And I'm appreciative of these relationships for doing that. I uh, love that. Uh, that was like, yeah. that was like the, the ending. I, I see that you're also a preacher. That was just beautiful. I love that. So I'm going to close it up there. I'm so thankful to Dr. Tinsley, to Cleve Tinsley and Dr. Elaine Howard Eklund uh, and uh, for their research, for their insights. So Elaine and Cleve, thank you so much. Uh, this event has been brought to you from the Ministry of Science for the Church, as well as Upper House at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you for being part of it. Thanks. Thanks.